Today we're creating a ridiculous composite using the 13 photos that I took in the last episode. We're gonna create that photo. What's happening guys? The whole point of these last two episodes has been about teaching you the importance of compositing. Uh, I've created this image using one light, one light only and just compositing in Photoshop. Imagine what you can do with a little bit of knowledge and a little bit more equipment. Uh, compositing opens up so many avenues to you and it really is such an important step to creating those high-end photos. Uh, today's tutorial, we're going to mostly go through creating the composite, but then I'm also going to take you through the rest of this Photoshop document so that you can see exactly how this image was created. All right, let's jump straight into Photoshop. So first things first, we have to get our images inside of Photoshop. So we go File, Scripts, Load Files, into Stack, click Browse and find our images wherever they are on your computer, select them all. These are all the stacks. I have them outputted from Capture One in their own folder called Stacks. Um, they're the images that we created in Helicon Focus, so the stacked images, hence stacks. Um, anyway, then we click OK, they all load up here. In an ideal world, you would click Attempt to Automatically Align Source Images, and bam, Photoshop would do some magic and everything would align perfectly. Um, sadly, in this case, that did not work. Um, I was recording videos simultaneously, and I ended up nudging the camera and uh, the surface where the watch was shooting quite a few times. Um, when you're creating uh, composites, when you're shooting for the composite, try and make sure neither your camera nor your subject move very much. If you do that, then it will be such an easier process from now onwards. Um, for me, like I said, that did not happen, so this does not work. Um, sometimes it will work, it, it all kind of depends. It's always worth a try. Uh, anyway, so we click OK. Everything loads up inside of Photoshop. You see all the layers will load up here, all nicely named. This is why it's very important to keep organized. Um, and then it's just a case of making our comp. Now, to make the comp, the first thing I do is I organize all these layers in a logical way. Um, I'm not going to do all of this now because I've already done it and I think it's a little bit boring for you to see this. Um, also, I've actually done a tutorial on compositing before and on some of the other techniques I'm going to mention today. Um, Today's tutorial is more of like a combination of all of them. It's going to give you a nice rounded view, not only of how this image is edited, but it's going to show you my workflow and a whole bunch of other things. Um, so anyway, first thing I do is I'll organize these layers into a logical order. Um, usually the thing closest to the camera will be on the bottom, the thing furthest away from the camera will be on the top. It doesn't have to be that way, but whatever. Um, for the moment, I just want to show you a couple techniques for creating the composite. Uh, if you want to see some more in detail, then check out that other tutorial I just mentioned. Um, so firstly, we have the face stack, then we can have the top left highlight, uh, and we'll also do the crown as well. Okay, so this is our base image. This would be the one that was on the bottom. So if we just ignore all of these, or better yet, I'll just delete them. Um, that would be our base image on the bottom and then everything else we would pile on top and create our, um, our masks and everything from there. So the top left highlight here, um, all we have to do, it's a two stage process to creating the composite. We have to align the images and then we have to create our masks and kind of combine them all together. Um, it's impossible to combine them if they're not aligned, so that is our first step. Um, I do that in one of two ways. I will either use the difference blend mode or I will lower the opacity to 50%. So if you look here, when I've turned it to difference, um, what happens is you see, unfortunately, when the images are, are very different as they are in this case, you know, this one is a normal exposure, this one's very dark, it can be quite difficult to do it in this way. Now you can still see this kind of like ghost image um, that was there. If it is dark like that, you can add a curves layer, clip it down, bump it up and that should hopefully help us see a little bit. Yeah, you see, you can see a little bit more. Um, but then anyway, so we change the difference and use, I just use the move tool. So that's V just to kind of nudge the image around and get it right. But as you can see, it's quite hard to see here. And we are actually aligning up here. And look, even though it was very closely aligned there, it was actually quite far off here. You see the difference that is, it was like that far off, that was miles off. Um, so that that's for a number of reasons, most likely because I moved the uh, camera and the uh, shooting table, nudging them while I was recording video. Um, but so I just align it to the area that I'm doing. So if we use this little lug as a reference, 
and just do something like that roughly. It doesn't even have to be perfect for this one because we're gonna do it in a really simple way. We're gonna change the blend mode of it to lighten and all that is gonna do is it's gonna say, Photoshop is gonna say uh, for this document, only show the lighter pixels. So it's comparing it to the one below. Anything lighter, it will show. Anything darker, it won't. Um, so there we go. It lightens up that area. I'll add a layer mask, invert that layer mask, and just paint it on in case it's lightening areas that I don't want it to. There we go. So that's easy. That's that bit done. And I would use the same process for most things. In most composites I make, I would use the same process. Uh, other than using the brush tool, I use the pen tool quite often. Um, we're going to do that with the crown here. It's completely unnecessary because uh, the crown is a very simple area, but we're going to do it nonetheless. Um, so again, we're going to change this to difference. And you see it's really obvious with this image because it's a much brighter one. And I can just align these areas. Mm. Yeah, oof, they're not aligning perfectly, but that's about right. And now if we come over to the crown, what you'll notice is it isn't actually very well aligned here. It's kind of hard to tell on difference, but you see this little edge here? That should line up there and it's not. So if we change this back to normal, pop it on to 50% opacity, it becomes really obvious. So, you know, sometimes different work, difference works. Sometimes it's better to do with opacity. Um, you just have to kind of experiment and see what works. So anyway, now those are aligned, all we have to do is create our mask. So I'm gonna use the pen tool, hit P for the pen tool. And like I said, this is complete overkill. Using the pen tool like this is just totally pointless, but I just wanted to show you that I use different methods for creating the masks. Um, I think with the watch here, I pretty much exclusively use the brush tool. Um, but sometimes if you're blending something a little bit more complicated, you might need to use the pen tool just to um, to make your adjustments. So there you go. That's a really, really rough um, outline which I've done there. And I'll just paint a little bit of this away because it's coming onto the edge of it. Ooh, grab that back. I'm using a Wacom tablet, and if I if you don't have this selected, then it doesn't use a pressure sensitivity. I, I love using the pressure sensitivity, and uh, it's a big part of uh, how I work. So that was why it didn't really paint properly initially then. There we go, so that's that done and moved. Like I said, if you were kind of selecting another area, like I don't know, if you, um, if you had some crazy exposure for here and you needed to cut out the 12 for some reason, um, then you might use the pen tool. There could be lots of reasons for it. You, you'll kind of discover it as you go. Um, but really that's about it for creating masks. Um, sometimes I might do something like uh, select and color range. So let's say I wanted to darken down all of the really bright metal bits here. So I go select color range and I'm just selecting, oh, there we go. I wanna select some of these bright areas. So if I take my fuzziness down and I just make sure I'm selecting only those really, really bright areas. There we go. And take the fuzziness up a little bit. And that's now created our selection. Hit the uh, mask button and that has output, outputted it to a selection. And that's only our bright areas within that uh, area there. So within the kind of bright metal. And then if I wanted to, you know, if this was a different exposure, which was darker, then we could obviously use that. Um, or you could use like a curve and clip it down and then just, and then just drag that down. And it should only affect, if I zoom in, it should only affect those really bright areas. Now it hasn't really done that much there. It's not going to do that much unless I do a really extreme adjustment, which looks terrible. Uh, but you get the idea. Um, you can use brush tool, pen tool, select color range, select focus area. You know, you could use all these different tools to make the selections. 99% of the time you're going to use the pen tool and the brush tool and that is it. All right, let's jump straight into the actual document so you can see how this was constructed because that is far more interesting than that. So here we go, this is our comp. You'll notice there are three documents here. We have my final document, 
the cleaning and contrast adjustments document, and then the comp here. Now I'll take you through each one uh, and show you exactly why there are three and what happens in each. So like I was explained before, in the first document, this is the comp document. This is where all of our files come in and get comped together. You've already seen that, you know how it's done. Um, but then the other stage is that I add these little curves next to each one. So if we toggle everything off, there we go. Mm -mm -mm. Toggle everything off and just start with that. That was our base image. In fact, it was the same image I was showing you a second ago. Then I mixed in some other image to take down some of those highlights like I was showing you before. I actually did it in a different technique, but that's beside the point. Um, and then I add a little curve. Now I do this, as you can see, for every single part. So for the next bit, we had the top left highlight up here and a curve which is clipped to it and then we have the top uh up oh, top left highlight version two that was when i changed it so you can ignore oh no no, no sorry my mistake again this is when i just used it for the uh, the lug up here so there was no um curve added there um, and then we had da, 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 the top left lug up there and again a curve attached to it and the right highlight and again a curve attached to it. Now what you might be noticing is that each curve is adjusting just a little bit of kind of the, the contrast as you'd expect of the area that it's clipped to. And the reason I'm doing that is it allows me to make really really targeted local uh, contrast adjustments. The most obvious one is for the face. Um, so I've just clipped it to the face. In this instance I have created a little mask um, and then I've just made my little contrast adjustment there. Um, this way of working is relatively new. I'm kind of working it into my workflow. I'm not sure if it's gonna stay or not because it does end up kind of baking in these settings. Um, but I tend to find that I never really go back and adjust this sort of thing. Um, so I am doing it at this stage because it's a little bit easier. It's nicer just to be able to clip that curves layer to whatever you were compositing and then just make an adjustment. It's really quick and easy. Um, so then, you know, it's just repeating the process. We go through that whole thing, doing it for all the other layers, adding in all the other extra little bits and doing some more curve adjustments. Mm -hmm. So I'm just really quickly running through them all here and showing you everything, but it's just repeating that process. It's adding one part of the composite, masking it, and then using a curves layer to adjust the contrast in that little area, in that tiny bit. So for every single um, 13 images that we had, all of those 13 images for the composite, I added a curves layer, clipped that down, and then adjust the contrast just for that part of the composite. Really, really helps. Um, so anyway, once that's done, I then save this. You see it here, there's the comp. Um, and then I create a new document and bring that in as what's called a linked layer or a linked smart object. Now, like I mentioned before, there is another tutorial for this. So feel free to click above and you can see that now. Um, I'm not gonna explain it in too much detail at the moment. Um, but all we do is we hit file and then place linked and you can, I'll just do it now quickly, file place linked, you navigate to where that is, click place and it'll appear there as a smart object. You can double click that and it will take you to its layer. Loads of benefits for that, but I'm not gonna go into them right now. Um, after having done that, created the comp and uh, created our new document, placed the linked layer, I then clean it. Cleaning is such an important stage, it cannot be emphasized enough. Um, it's a massive difference between professional images and amateur ones. If I see some dust in an image or something that should not be there, I'm just like, that's obviously not done by a professional or it's done by somebody with a very low budget. <laughs> um, so anyway, so cleaning is the next phase. Um, again, I have another video on this. Um, click above, again, I explain my three most common techniques for cleaning, which are frequency separation, painting, and then using dust and scratches. Um, you'll see in the layers here, that is exactly what I did. So we had frequency separation, dust and scratches, a little bit of spot healing, and then all of these layers are painting, and then that's adding noise to each layer that I've painted on. I wouldn't usually retain all of these layers because again, I very rarely have a client say, hey, you cleaned my image too much. Um, so what I'd usually do is just merge these together, um, but 
for the purpose of demonstration, I did keep them so that you guys could see. Um, after that is contrast corrections. Now I made most of them in the other section like I already showed you, um, but I did make a couple other little ones here, um, very minor, so there was just like a general contrast layer which looks like that. And then we had targeted contrast, again, just a little bit more for the face and then for the straps, as for the strap rather as well. And then that was that. And then we do our color corrections. Um, this is where I will use my color correction lamp. You can see it here. It's a daylight balanced lamp um, and it will allow me to see the products as they should be. Um, and then I just manually adjust the color to get them right. There are more scientific methods of doing it, but this is the way I found works best for me, um, especially because lots of colors can be accidentally introduced on set. Um, so speaking of which, if you look here, we can see that there is this blue tint just up above, especially if I exaggerate the color. This is one of my check layers. Um, it's just literally dragging the saturation up to 90 to really exaggerate it. And you can very obviously see there's some blue there. So to get rid of it, all I did is if you just have a look here, we can see if you go to the blue channel, I've just taken that blue mostly all the way out. It shouldn't really be there at all. It was probably reflecting from something on set, not sure what, and just took that out. And then there are other layers which do similar things, reducing saturation on the crown up here, on the strap, just go full screen, on the strap, um, and then like the metal color and things like that, really simple. And then again, we save this, and we create another Photoshop document, which I call cleaning. Um, and then we combine those two together um, by just placing this one as a linked layer inside the final document. So I'll show you again. So inside our final document, inside our final document, we have a linked layer here, which is referencing the Photoshop document I was just showing you. Um, and then we have the background, which I've created. So the background is just a black solid color layer with a little glow on top of it. To create the glow, I create a new layer by hitting Control Alt Shift N or Command Option Shift N on a Mac. We grab our brush tool, make sure we haven't got pressure sensitivity turned on, make it nice and big and soft. You could use a color, uh, or I just used white in this instance, and I just click. And then what I then do is I create gradually more soft versions of this. So I duplicate it by hitting Control or Command J, and then I have a shortcut set up for Gaussian Blur, but I'll just show you where it is now. You go Filter, Blur, and Gaussian Blur, and I start off at like, say, 150, and then I'll duplicate it again and blur it by, say, 300. Uh, there is no specific recipe for this. I just do it randomly and then decide what I like uh, and then change it. Oh. Yes, a thousand, please. Mm -mm -mm. See it just working, there we go. And then what I do is I will use opacity to decide how much I want all of these to be seen. So let's say I want the outside layer to be quite strong, so we have it at 70%, because it's a nice little subtle glow. And then this one to be a little bit less, 50, this one at like 40, 30, and which one's that? Yeah, and that one can be at about 30 as well. And then there we have this really, really soft, subtle gradient from this uh, from this light, which looks a lot more realistic. Uh, I then tend to merge them, and I'll do things like adding noise at this point, just to get rid of the banding. Um, it's important to note right now that when you add noise here, you need to be working in 16-bit to get rid of the banding. At least that's my experience. Um, so if I went now, um, mm -mm, let's just go out. Make sure you're zoomed in to at least beyond 66.67%, uh, otherwise you don't tend to see uh, the update. So the usual process here, if I just add another new black layer, the usual process here for me would be to add some noise to the background layer. So let's just say we add like two of Gaussian and then also add noise to this layer. I'm currently working in 8-bit and you can see it's not getting rid of that noise. See, I'm in 8-bit right now. Sorry, it's not getting rid of the, uh, the banding, the lines that you're seeing here. If we were in 16-bit, it would get rid of that. Uh, reason I'm currently in 8-bit 
uh, is because I'm doing this as a tutorial for you guys. Um, so I lowered it to 8-bit just so things work a little bit quicker. Um, so anyway, that's the little glow created. Then we add our watch here. That's our watch, everything we've done up until this point. And then I tend to do some little minor adjustments. So I decided to adjust Mm -mm -mm. There we go. I decided to adjust the brightness a little bit just to bring it down a little bit. Um, again, brightens the strap a little bit. Um, uh, that's up here. The lug up there was a little bit too bright. It was uh, taking my attention away from the rest of the watch and it was a little bit too saturated as well. And that was it. Those are kind of like those little minor adjustments. And then we had sharpening and a little bit of noise, which I tend to add to my images at the very end. So that's it, I created this image using one light and just a little bit of Photoshop knowledge. Now yeah, granted that knowledge took me years to attain, but hopefully the last two videos have shown you that it is something you can do, it's not too difficult, and it's made you realize how important compositing is as a technique. Now, if you liked today's video, please hit the like button. If you wanna see more from me, click subscribe and make sure you hit that little bell button so you don't miss anything. Uh, if you've got any comments, chuck them down below and I'll do my best to help. Uh, other than that, I will catch you later.